I recently uh, read an article about a man by the name of Lawrence Lemieux. It was written by a, a gentleman by the name of Philip Holt. And this man was a rower in the 1988 Summer Olympics. Okay? He wasn't a rower, but he was a fin operator of a boat that goes in the water. Anyways, on the morning of September 24th, 1988, during the fifth race, the wind was very boisterous and he missed one of the buoys. Well, in turning around to go back to that buoy, he noticed that a boat from another race has capsized. And it was a two-man boat. Now, this was done in South Korea during the time. It says, however, he suddenly spotted an upturned hull of a boat from a different class of competition, a 470 dinghy, sailed by two Singaporeans. One of the sailors' name was Chan, and the other's name was Siu. So what happened was, is this man, Lemieux, who was in... He was supposed to be the, one of the favorites to win the gold medal in, this, in the competition that he was in. And he realized that if he was to leave those people capsized in the boat or in the water, that it would have been a very hard time for rescuers to notice a head bobbing in the water. So instead of him just forgetting about it and finishing the race, he decided to go over to them. And he brought this man. Now he's only in a single, like it's a single person boat. And so he brings this other guy in, into his boat and hope it doesn't capsize. And then the, the other guy, they go over to him and he's, he's just hanging onto this, this ship that had capsized or this dinghy that had capsized and he had cut his hand pretty bad. And it took... The, the, he waited until the Korean officials came and uh, had brought them into their vessel, and he lost 15 minutes in this race. Now, he still finished 22nd for this race. Now, with that being said, he did not get a medal. All right? The article is, is, is titled, is entitled, doing the right thing when no one is watching, okay? No one was there to see him do the right thing. But somebody told their story. And because somebody told their story, he got a, uh, it's called the Olympic Committee Pierre de Coubertin Medal for True Sportsmanship. And it's only an award that's only been given up until 2016 a total of 18 times in the amount of years that the Olympics have been going on for. And so Lemieux's reflection when he was interviewed by an Edmonton journalist, he says, I, I could have won gold, but in the same circumstances, I would do it again. The Bible, this is where I messed up. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the book of Ruth, okay? The book of Ruth, okay? And this book is probably, it's, it's in my top five. There's no doubt about it that this book is in my top five. I've been reading this book, I don't know, over and over again, it seems like for at least the last four or five weeks. And every time I read it, I just see... God's hand on this, this whole situation. So I pray that it's a blessing for you this evening. Let's bow forward a prayer. Precious Father, Lord, we do thank you and we praise you, Lord, for the wonderful God that you are. I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that it would change us, that you would use us and that you would guide us, Lord, and that we would do an incredible work for you. Lord, that this place would be full. Lord, fill us now with your spirit. Guide me now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I want you to notice the very first book, very first verse in the first book of first chapter. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. He, his wife, and his two sons. We know the man's name is Elimelech. It tells us in verse number two. But I don't want you to miss what verse one says. All right? The verse one uses a word, sojourn. Sojourn. And it's important because, well, what does sojourn mean? Pastor Taylor likes to ask questions while he preaches, so I think it's important. What does sojourn mean? Mr. Bowen. Okay, okay. Stay there for a while. Anyone else want to take a guess? Mrs. Smith. Okay, short amount of time, not a long amount of time. Your hand went up, Amanda. Okay. You guys are all on the right page. The word sojourn means to dwell for a time, to dwell or live in a place as a temporary resident or as a stranger, not considering the place as a permanent habitation. Okay? Not considering the place as a permanent habitation. In other words, it was never Elimelech's intentions of staying in the country of Moab. It was never Elimelech's intentions of his sons staying there long enough for them to marry in the country of Moab. No, it were was it Elimelech's intentions of dying in the country of Moab? And we know that he dies. In verse number three, it says, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons, all by herself with her two sons. And now what happens? She doesn't leave. She stays there. And what happens? They took wives of the women of Moab in verse 4, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there, how long? Ten years. Now, what happened to that temporary place? What happened to it? It turned into ten years. I don't know about you, but when you get a temporary job, you're not going to be there for ten years, okay? You got a temporary job, you're there for six months, you may be there for a year. Now, why did they leave in the first place? They left because there was a famine in the land, right? Well, guess what? No famine in the Bible lasted 10 years. Okay? The longest famine recorded in Scripture is seven years, and that's found in Genesis 41 to 45. And that, we all know, is the account of Joseph. Okay? In while they were in Egypt, and he was the second in command, the Bible says that they were going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And so we know that there was no famine that lasted ten years. In fact, it, when the, while they were making their journey back to Judah, Bethlehem Judah, the Bible says that they came during barley harvest. Okay? So there was already things that were starting to grow. There was already, they were already harvesting things that already had been done. So why didn't Naomi take her family back to the land of Bethlehem, Judah, after her husband died? You know, the, the thing is, is I can't answer that for you. But just because I can't answer that for you, God used that situation. 
He used that situation. You know, the Bible says that they were there 10 years. 10 years of living in a country they should not have been in. Now, I understand there was famine in the land, right? And sometimes you, gotta, you may move to a different section, okay? But did they really have to go to the country of Moab to, get to, to be being fed by God? I don't know. The Bible just says that it was during the time of judges that there was famine in the land. But they were there 10 years. 10 years of living in the country who were known to worship false gods. They were known to worship false gods. If you want to read that for yourself, Numbers chapter 25 talks about them being in Shittim. All right? And how they, they were... They were doing whoredom against with the Moabites. All right, the children of Israel were, and they were worshiping their false gods. And then we see in verse five, and Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the women was left and her two sons, ever two sons and her husband. So who was left now? Nobody, except Naomi. They came into the land, she had a husband, she had two sons, and now she's in the land, she's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons, and now she's stuck there with her two daughter-in-laws. We see the result of leaving Bethlehem Judah for food that not only did her husband die, but her sons died. And there she is, alone with Orpah and Ruth. The Bible tells us in verse number 6 that Naomi rose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab how Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So I asked myself this question, how did she hear about it? <laughs> All right. It's not recorded for us in scripture, but she clearly heard of it. So then I got thinking, well, how, if she heard of it, then that means somebody had to travel to that place. So I kind of wanted to see how far it would have been traveling-wise from Bethlehem, Judah, to Moab, which is just on the other side of the Dead Sea. It is, depending on the path that you take, 30 to 60 miles, or 7 to 10 days journey on foot. A week, <laughs> a week, and all they had to do was go back home. They didn't, okay? They didn't. They were there for the 10 years. And you know, in verse 7, we see how the journey begins. It says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And then in verse 8, we see that Naomi's command given to Orpah and Ruth. It is a command by Naomi to Orpah and to Ruth. And this is the first time that they disobeyed their mother-in-law. All right? Just remember that. They disobeyed. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt uh, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. I want you to notice that although these women were from the country of Moab, they still played an important part in Naomi's life. Naomi said, the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. They were there to help her. They were there to console her. They were there to console one another. They had developed a very close personal relationship or a bond with one another. And we see the response to Naomi in verse number 10. As the Bible says, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. That's their response. That's their first response to Naomi telling them to go back home. Surely we're going to return with you. 
I want you to remember that because it's important. Verse number 10, right? So we read the first time that Orpah and Ruth disobeyed the command given to them. And then in verse 11 it says, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old and have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were uh, grown? Would you stay for them, having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. It sad Naomi for their sakes that the hand of the Lord had gone out against her. Is that what happened? Does the Lord's hand ever go out against us? It can, but that's not what happened here. Was there heartache in her trial? Sure there was. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons. She was in a strange land. All right, so there was heartache and trials. There was challenge in her trial. You know, I suspect that Naomi had been in the country of Moab for so long that she started to forget about God. She took her eyes off God. Even though we read here that it says, the Lord bless thee. All right? I want you to remember that. The Lord bless thee. But she had forgotten. She had been in a land so long that she forgot what it was like to turn to him. How maybe instead of turning to him in her time of need, she thought it better to receive consolation from others. Which I might add is not a bad thing. All right? Being consoled from other people isn't a bad thing, but it's when you put those people in front of God that could be, a, that could be an issue. All right? We should never try to substitute God with anyone else. With anyone else. You know, God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. All right? He knows our past. He knows our present. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're going to go through. And there's nothing that hasn't gone by God that has gotten to us first. All right? Even Satan had to ask Job for permission. Well, it, God kind of just let him. All right? Have you not considered my servant Job? All right? But you're just blessing him, or you're, he's just praising you because you're blessing him. Well, that's not what happened. But, you know, we should never try and substitute. God with anyone else. You know, when I was going through this, Laura came in the room and she shared with me a story from when she was little. She said that when she lived in Hamilton, there was downstairs in the laundry room and she got mad at God. Get this, because she couldn't find a sock. <laughs> she couldn't find a sock. And so it got me thinking, of course, how strong is your faith in God that you wouldn't be mad at him for the things he's brought you through or bringing you through? How strong is your faith in God that you wouldn't be mad at him for the things that's happened to you? Now, obviously, Laura was a little girl at the time. But still, is that something that we would get upset at God about? We can't find a sock. Maybe there are things that we're going through. We don't understand them. All right? Well, in, in this, you know what happens? The Bible, in the Bible, in verse number 14, it says, And they lifted up their voice and they wept again. They cried the first time that uh, Naomi told them to go back. And they cried a second time. And the Bible says that Orpah uh, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. We see that this time around, Orpah listened to her mother-in-law. But once again, Ruth disobeyed. All right? Ruth disobeyed. 
The Bible says that she clave unto her. You know that word clave? It, means to, it comes from the word cleave, which means to stick or to adhere to or to hold on to. Or in other words, I am not letting you go anywhere without me. That's what Ruth's saying to her mother-in-law. And we see how far Naomi was willing to go to get Ruth to leave her. In verse, look in verse number 15. It's actually a very sad verse in Naomi's testimony. It says, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto the, her people and unto her gods. Return after thou, thou sister-in-law. Could you imagine if we did that today? Think about that for a second. Naomi knew who the Lord was. There's no doubt about it. All right? We know who the Lord is. And yet Naomi is encouraging her to return to her gods. Is that something that we could be guilty of today? Whether it's through our testimony or even how we treat others, possibly. How we react or look at others could affect on someone turning away from God. Even fellow Christians, it is a crucial, it is so crucial that we remain focused on the Lord. I know I preached that message the last time I was up here about focusing on God. But that's what it all comes down to in the end because if we have our focus on God, then those things that people are going through or maybe even those, you know, those times where we're going to have reactions, those knee-jerk reactions that we're going to have, they're not going to be putting people away from us or away from the Lord. They're going to be bringing people closer to God. Because then they, just as Mar Martha said this evening, it was, it's an, been an encouragement to see how faithful Pastor Taylor and Mrs. Taylor have been through their trial. Through their trial. You know, and finally, we see the third and final time that Ruth disobeyed her mother-in-law. You know, these are, it's, when you read this book, this is probably the most, these are the most beautiful words in this whole entire book, is Ruth's response to her mother-in-law at this point. All right? It says, because, and, and, and it's, it's important because Ruth, not only does she go against what Naomi said and, and just kind of just forgets what she had said, but she says, I'm going to serve the God of heaven. So I'm going to, my God is going to be your God. The Bible says in verse number 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave or return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Entreat means to ask earnestly, or to beg, or plead, or implore. In other words, please, I want to stay with you. I want to stay with you. I want to be with you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your God is going to be my God. Your people are going to be my people. And where you die, I'm going to die too. I kind of joked around with Pastor Taylor with this. Uh, last week, I told him that Ruth disobeyed three times. Actually, I said two, but... God show me three. And uh, he's like, I still don't know where you're talking about. But it's not, it's not God that Ruth disobeyed. It is her mother-in-law, okay? So it was kind of a trick question there, a trick uh, with the uh, whole lesson there. But it's Ruth disobeyed her mother-in-law's command to return home. And you know what? Home. What about Ruth's home? Ruth left her family, she left her home, she left everything that she knew. Why? Because well, she was willing to follow God. She was willing to follow God. You know what that's a representation of? Guess what? When we get saved, all right, our sin nature is in the past. 
And that is a clear presentation of Ruth just forgetting about the, her past, putting everything behind her, and looking forward to God. And now she's, she's begun this whole new life right from the start now. And as she's going to a new place, yes, she's still with her mother-in-law, who at this point is a very bitter lady. Okay? But she's leaving everything behind. Leaving it all in the past. And she's going to start something new. She's going to start something incredible. And she left her family. The Bible does say in, in Ruth 2.11 that she had left her mother and her father. Okay? So if you wanted to read that, you can notice there is a reference to that verse. But she left it. But you know what the sad thing is about this? After this, we don't read about Orpah anymore. We don't read about Orpah anymore. She's forgotten. She's mentioned in the, at the first chapter and that's it. No more. No more blessings from God. And what did she go back for? She went back to her gods. She went back home. Why? Because of uncertainty? She didn't know what was going to happen or what was going to take place? I mean, yeah, you know what? She had encouragement from Naomi to go back. She, she still had a choice. I remember I said what, they, what she had said in verse number 10. It says, and they, they, that's important. It says, and they said unto her, surely we will return unto thy people. They. It's both of them. It's pluralized. Both of those girls said they were going to return. And after two times of being coaxed, one gave in. But one did not. One stood strong. So what can we learn from this account tonight? What can we learn from this? This is a big one. Don't think that you're strong enough on your own, to survive in a fallen world. Don't. We're not strong enough. You know, the longer they stayed in Moab, the further they got from God. And we see that. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we can encourage others. This is another thing that we can learn. Sometimes, if we're not careful... We can encourage others to turn away from God. Naomi was hurt. She was bitter. She was tired. And because of all of these things, she had in her mind that the hand of God had left her. Verse 21 says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testif that testified against me, the Almighty hath afflicted me. What happened? Well, she had a why me attitude. She had a why me attitude instead of a Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. I need you. I can't do this without you. Look, I don't know what everyone is going through in this room. All right? But I can assure you today that God does. God has been rejected. He's been accused of doing something he didn't do. And he died a death he didn't deserve. But bless God, there was victory when he rose from the dead. Turn to him. Turn to him. Lean on him. Learn of him. Jesus commands us to, Matthew eleven, twenty eight. 28, come unto me. And I said this, was saying this to Laura last night as she was having a hard time sleeping with some certain things that she had been thinking about. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for, your, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, we're never going to lean. 
We're never going to trust to go and always go to the Lord if we're not doing the learning part. That's where it comes in. The learning part. How are you ever supposed to know how great God is if we're not learning about Him? How we're not spending time with Him? How He's not... You know, he shows you things through this blessed book and it's... I don't know, this year is just... I know it says, I keep saying about this year, but I've never been more hungry, I guess, for the Word that as I've been right, right from the start. So, you know, I pray that that's what our desire is, to have that desire to learn of Him. And then finally, sometimes what others require is a thing called encouragement. Encouragement. Ruth was willing to go where Naomi went, was willing to leave everything she knew behind so she could serve the God of heaven. You know, after this account in, in chapter 1, guess what? Naomi didn't ever ask Ruth to leave again. There's no account of Naomi asking Ruth to ever leave again. Do you want to leave? Do you want to leave? Do you want to leave? No. Because they went together. They went together. And yes, you know what? At the end of chapter 1, Naomi's still bitter. And it's Ruth that stayed faithful. It was Ruth that stayed faithful. She did everything her mother-in-law told her after chapter 1. After chapter 1. She chose to stand up for what was right, even when someone was telling her to do the wrong thing. Everyone in this room has been given gifts. Most of you in this room have been saved longer than me. Okay? You've been saved longer than me. Are you passing your wisdom, your knowledge, and things that God has done for you down to the younger generation? They need that. They need to see that yes, you know, you guys had, and, I, and I'm the same way, all right? I've had my struggles when I was younger, all right? I didn't know God until I was 28. Well, I say I don't know God until I didn't know the Lord, all right, until I was 28. And so, yeah, 28 years went by, and, and those years are years that I know some of the youth in our church are struggling with. And it's up to us to come alongside them and to help them, to encourage them that they're not alone. There are experiences that we go through that God allows us to go through for, for a reason. For a reason. Don't waste it. You know, God has shown you, maybe he's shown you some things through his word. Through your Bible reading that you can encourage someone that is struggling. Don't waste what God has allowed you to see. You know, you know what that is called? That's called testimony. All right? Testimony. Whose testimony? It's God's testimony. All right? What God has done in your life and who He truly is, don't keep that to yourself. Don't keep that even with your, just your closest friends or your, maybe your grandkids. No, allow others to be a part of that blessing. The blessing of knowing what God has done in your life. Because what happens? What happens when people start praising God? Well, we saw it tonight. All over the room, people are praising God. All right? It's a chain reaction. All right? There's an uplift in spirit when people are praising God. And so the younger generation, they need to see that too. We can praise the God, and we can praise God for what he has done for us. Together, forever. You know, the article about Lawrence Lemieux who gave up the medal to others to save others can have an effect on us. What is it 
that we have to give up to have an effect, uh, to have an impact on others? What is it that we have to give up, or what is it that you have to give up to have an impact on others? Maybe it's sometimes we have to overcome sharing the gospel with others. Maybe it's even experiences that God has brought you through. Either way, we got to take our eyes off ourselves. We got to take our eyes out even off of others. We got to put our eyes on God. All right? And let him lead us just as he led Ruth. And you know what? Ruth's the account of Ruth is is incredible account. I hope like the next time I preach I'm probably going to preach from chapter 2 just so you know, but it is it is a blessed book. This book is a blessed book. It's a God show me new things every every single day. I encourage you spend time with him, learn of him, trust him, and let him lead you. Share with others, be an encouragement to him. Be an encouragement to others on his behalf. Let's pray.